Hello, everyone. How's everyone feeling? I'm Lisa excited. <laughs> I'm so happy to hear that. Great to see you. I, I, I was um, um, waxing poetic about the film that you were about to see because it is so powerful. I'm Lisa Ling, and I'm so thrilled to be with you. You really are in for such a treat. Um, you know, I think we all need some inspiration and light right now. And Rocking the Boat, the story of Lily Lee Chen, directed by Nox Yang, is that. It is such an inspiring film and a story that we need to see and know right now. As most of us know, our history, AAPI history, has been absent, just erased from our history books. And that is finally starting to change. And one person is certain to occupy a lot of space in AAPI history, and that is the great Lily Lee Chen. Now, before we start the film about this extraordinary woman, I want to invite another trailblazer in her own right to share opening remarks. Congresswoman Judy Chu became the first Chinese American woman elected to the United States Congress in 2009. She serves the 27th district, which includes Pasadena and West San Gabriel Valley, which is where the best Chinese food is. She serves on the House Ways and Means Committee and was elected chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus in 2011. She has been just a tireless voice for the AAPI community for too many years to count. So Congresswoman Chu, thank you so much for joining us. I, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. Yes, it's wonderful to see everybody here this evening. I'm Congress member Judy Chu, and I'm thrilled to be joining you during AAPI Heritage Month for the premiere of the documentary, The Story of Lily Li Chen. I want to especially thank your filmmaker, Knox Yang, for creating this 17-minute mini documentary about Lily's uphill journey. It is amazing that despite COVID, and its many challenges, you were able to bring together so many people to talk about an extraordinary woman. And it is truly an honor to have been included in this film about Lily. She ran for office because she knew she had the capacity to better the lives of residents in our community. At that point in time, there was a lot of resentment from longtime residents about the influx of new immigrants, most of whom were of Asian descent. But that discrimination did not hold Lily back. So, so it was incredible that she ran for the Monterey Park City Council and became the first Chinese American woman mayor in our nation. Her actions showed that anything was possible. And during her time on the council, she was a strong advocate for everyone in our community. In fact, because of her leadership, the city of Monterey Park was able to receive funds to expand the elementary school and able to close a local landfill. As mayor, she successfully lobbied for Monterey Park to host the field hockey competition during the 1984 Olympics. And through her efforts, the city won the National Civic League's All-American City Award in 1985. After her work on the city council, she continued to uplift and help underserved communities nationwide. She became a founding board member of the Committee of 100 and was appointed to numerous advisory councils by President Carter and President Ford. Through these appointments, she was able to spearhead an initiative to federally fund the English as a Second Language program and su successfully included Asian Pacific Americans as the fourth recognized minority group. While I've been only able to touch on a small portion of Lily's accomplishments, you can see how extraordinary she is. And I hope this film about Lily's courage and strength serves as an inspiration for AAPIs, women, and other minorities to dream big, run for public office, and continue fighting to break barriers. Thank you to Lily Chen for her service, and I hope everyone enjoys the film and the great panel discussion. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Representative Chu, for those powerful remarks and for your constant advocacy for our community in the, on the Hill and everywhere else. So appreciate you taking the time to be with us tonight. Thank you so much. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy the beautiful and inspiring Rocking the Boat, the story of Lily Lee Chen.
As the first Chinese American woman to serve as mayor, Lily B. Chen. She is a born fighter, trailblazer, powerhouse, coalition builder, superwoman, the mentor, a woman way ahead of her time. Lily came into the mainstream politics when it wasn't easy. She saw the need to become a voice for our community. Took the brave first step. She wasn't just part of history, but she changed history. She inspired other women and Asian Americans to follow suit. Her life has been an extraordinary tribute for the betterment of our humanity. I was born in Tianjin, China. Because of the Civil War, we took the very last boat, leaving Tianjin to Taiwan. She gave Grandpa and Grandma bundles of joy, even though she knew in her heart that they really wanted a boy. <laughs> she was the middle of three daughters. Her mother was a failure in that she had only daughters. There was no son to carry on the family name. My mother used to tell my father, Lily is going to be the son. Lily is going to make you proud. Lily is going to deliver. She was right. I was determined. I want to prove to my father I can be somebody. Her father was a senator in Taiwan, so he was very prominent. He would give speeches. So he actually was a role model in a sense for my mother and mentored her in speech. She traveled around Taiwan making prize-winning speeches, attaining success far beyond anyone's reaches. She won many speech contests, and that's ultimately led her to become a student ambassador on a group visit to the United States. I first came to America, to Honolulu, Hawaii, was to attend the International Youth Leaders Conference. It was a great experience. She was pretty amazed by what the U.S. had to offer, the kindness of the people welcoming her, and John F. Kennedy and a lot of the things he was trying to envision. This actually was a big inspiration for her in wanting to stay in the United States. In 1958, I returned to America, wanting to be an immigrant American under the Kennedy Johnson's administration. She studied at San Francisco State, met my father. He was in graduate school in engineering at UC Berkeley. They were introduced by friends at a Chinese restaurant. In talking to each other, they realized that they were both on the same boat that escaped communist China into Taiwan. Kind of like fate that they ended up together. I was too young to believe in fate, but I got to know Paul. We were deeply in love with each other, very quickly. They're polar opposites. Um, my mother is gregarious, outgoing, extrovert, passionate. My father was calm, steady, detail-oriented, and patient as can be. One time she told my dad, oh, I, I have to go get something. Can you wait for me for a second? And he must have waited for like two or three hours, just incredibly patient. And she was telling me, oh, that's a good sign because he, was, he had the patience to be there for me, even though it was really a difficult thing for him to go do. It was a time when they were both very low on cash. And would you know it, on their drive up north, they had a terrible automobile crash. They drove, I think, in Portland. They were driving up, getting ready for his first job, and the car flipped, flipped over on the side of the road, my dad broke his neck, and at that time, he didn't have a job yet. Mom decided it was time to get married fast, even though dad would be showing up to the wedding in a full neck cast. 
we went to the local court. All these other people were laughing. They said, why they want to be married in a hurry like this? But they didn't realize what is happening to an immigrant person without a home. We have no other choice. If I marry him, he will have a home. My mom had to work three jobs in order to pay the hospital bills to fix his broken neck. Plus having me and my sister. The amount of hardship that they experienced, I do recall that vividly. It was in Los Angeles the Chans decided to start a new life. And mom, in those days, it felt it wasn't enough just to be a wife. My mother was a medical social worker initially, working in a hospital. She later transferred to L.A. County and the Department of Children's Services became an administrator. When I was around high school, she actually was appointed to White House Committee on Adult Education and also to the White House Conference on Families. For the past 27 years, I worked for the Los Angeles County. I learned how the government worked. Then I found the problems. There were many rules and regulations. I really did not feel it was practical. Many other regulations I felt that need change. I was in no position to changing them. So that was one of the reasons I decided that I would run for city council. I am going to make the law. The first foray into politics was actually running for city council in Monterey Park in the late 70s. We did have some family discussions. I remember even as a teenager, both of my sister and I said, oh, go for it. My dad, he embraced it completely also. My father was unusual for an Asian man. He believed in supporting her in her endeavors, her wishes, her dreams, and her beliefs. When she decided to run for mayor, he actually left his job for a year to commit to supporting her and to actually working on the campaign. He never enjoyed politics, but he wanted to work for me, for the community, because that was my interest. We were 100% in, all in on her pursuing her dream. And actually, it was a family affair. I actually went door to door with her. We have a lot of fundraisers or banquets just to sit there and kind of observe the presence that my mom Lily had in the room when she was to be able to speak to her supporters and the energy that they got, really powerful. My most interesting experience was candidate night. For the first time, I had the opportunity to speak to a general public. As soon as the meeting was over, I had so many people, young and old, flock to me. They said, Mrs. Chen, we didn't realize you have so much concern about the problems of the city. You're not a stranger. You are one of our own. Can I volunteer to help you? She got so much support from the community, it was just incredible. Her ability to articulate what she wanted, her vision, her strategy, blending of cultures, and really representing the entire community, just a combination of all those different things, those were powerful. On June the 3rd, 1981, when the result was published, I lost the election by 28 votes. So it was incredibly close, and it was her first time running. I wrote a letter to the editor. I said that I feel like a winner. I was very grateful to receive so much support. Not only I rejected the recount, but also I went to the city council, congratulated him. We were empowered, emboldened by the result and that just made the next campaign to run much more strong. When I tried again in 1982, I had this overwhelming support because they said, Lily deserve a chance. In 1983, the year Lily Chen became mayor of Monterey Park. 
Can you imagine how ecstatic we were to find out that she got the highest vote count in the history of the city? It was the first for the country, the first Chinese-American female mayor in the United States. The election signifies many things. It uh, symbolizes the fact that the glass ceiling, particularly for Asian-American politicians, has been broken. She was a trailblazer, what can you say? I have to say, I have experienced the best and the worst. In 1982, one of the new members of CACA, the Chinese American Citizens Alliance, was Lily Li Chen. We learned immediately that she was involved in some new controversies in Monterey Park because of the growing Chinese population there. Monterey Park at that time was a third Asian American, a third Hispanic, and a third white. But there was definite prejudice against people from Asia that came over. And when I was growing up in the 80s, I was considered an ABC, which is American-born Chinese. And then there were folks that immigrated. They were called FOBs, fresh off the boat. The reason I did not want to recount was because during the campaign, I have already experienced the resentment from the old timers. When I walked door to door, the minute people saw my face, they closed the door. They did not like to see me. They did not like to see an Asian face. And I already know about their resentment. My husband and I moved to Monterey Park in 1971. And just one day, it seemed like downtown Monterey Park was full of Chinese and signs that we couldn't read at all. The rest of us felt like, you no longer live here. This is no longer your city. And it was people were very upset. So my husband and I, we worked on a petition with several other people. When Frank Curry presented the English-only proposal, the first thing he said to me, we are tired of you people taking over our city. At the end of his presentation, he threw U.S. Constitution to my face. Now he was mad, you know. Hey, this is our country too. People going around threatening people. They did graffiti on the theaters saying the Asians go home. A gas station had a sign that said, "Will the last American to leave Monterey Park please bring our flag. It was so insulting. The target was toward me. I felt sorry for poor Lily because she always was in between. She advocated for everybody in the community and that made her sometimes a target for everybody. Because of this sentiment, the first thing I did when I took office as the mayor, I applied our Merck City to USA Today. I was hoping the newcomers would feel the pride. I hope that the old timers will say, yes, give them a chance. It takes time for them to assimilate to become full-fledged Americans. The difference is only you came here earlier than the rest of us. Lily tried very hard to be a good council member. I have to say that. I didn't always agree with her, but I said some of the decisions were not easy to make. When President Carter appointed me to serve as his advisor for adult education, the first opportunity I got was to recommend that ESL program had to be implemented throughout the nation for free. Our federal government should pay for it. How can you blame the new immigrant not speaking English, not participating in the mainstream American society without helping them to learn English? When she was mayor, she became a target of some hatred. The anti-immigrants, the overt discrimination really picked up in Monterey Park. I want to say what Lily did. She stood firm. She sent out a message that said plainly, I am a proud American. We immigrants are proud Americans. 
we will not leave the city. And we will raise the American flag because we love the flag and what it stands for, liberty and justice for all and freedom for all, no matter where you come from, even if you have an accent, this is America for all, justice for all. That's what we stand for. Thank you. She carried on her basic mission of serving minorities and the underprivileged. On the Monterey Park City Council, she focused on making things better for the residents of the city. She worked to close a local landfill. She sought funds for the expansion of an elementary school. She successfully lobbied to have Monterey Park host the Olympics field hockey games. She started the Chinese Political Action Committee, CPAC, one of the first political organizing committees to give voice to Asian Americans. She served on the Democratic National Committee. She also ran for Congress. I know she wasn't successful, but I know she gave it her all. And whenever she got involved in anything, she really put her heart into it. Lily was founding member of a number of prominent Asian American organizations providing critical services to the Asian American community. She partnered deeply with people of different backgrounds. Many people after her have been encouraged to run for office and to take on leadership roles. The first Chinese American, the first Asian American, the first woman, but always working to be the mentor, the teacher, the enabler, working hard to make sure that although she was the first, she would certainly not be the last. Thank you, Lily Lee Chan. to say I was so impressed with Helen and Arthur Chen's poetry skills as well. <laughs> um, so let me introduce our esteemed panel this evening. Firstly, she obviously needs no introduction at all, but I'll do it anyway. Lily Li Chen herself. As you know, she was the former mayor for, of Monterey Park and the first ever Chinese American woman to be elected mayor in the United States. She also served 27 years in the LA County Department of Public Services and received several presidential appointments. The LA Times called her one of the eight women you should know. Mayor Chen, yeah. thanks so Hi. much for being here. How did, it, how did it feel to see the film with, with all of these um, people watching along with you? Oh, I'm just deeply honored to have your presence. <laughs> you know, I'm just... I want, to, I want to ask you about Paul a little bit later because uh, he, he sounds like he was such a, an extraordinary supporter of yours. So I'll be, yeah. I'll be talking to you about that in, in a little bit. Um, first, I, I also want to in, introduce uh, Julia Chang Block, who is also with us tonight. She's the first Chinese American US ambassador. She was appointed to Nepal by President George H.W. Bush, and she co-founded the Organization of Chinese American Women and founded the US China Education Trust and currently serves as president. Ambassador Block, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you, Lisa. I mean, it's such an honor and delight to be here tonight with Lily. Well, we uh, so that film you. was so powerful. It brought back so many memories and it is such a wonderful legacy that the younger generation can see it, see Lily in action and be inspired and motivated and to follow in her footsteps. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us this evening, Ambassador. Uh, we also have Dr. Russell Jung, who is the a professor of Asian American studies at San Francisco State University and was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World in 2021. He co-founded the incredible organization Stop AAPI Hate, a national coalition against anti-AAPI hate and racism. Dr. Jung, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Thanks, Lisa, and congratulations, Mayor Chen, for the movie, and congratulations, Knox, for um, producing and directing such an excellent film. I'm glad to be here. Yes, finally, the director of Rocking the Boat, Knox Yang. Knox uses storytelling to connect audiences with communities, raise awareness, and promote cross-cultural awareness in her films. Her past subjects have included Chinese international students, 
formerly incarcerated women of color and sex trafficking survivors. Knox, amazing job. It's such a, a beautiful, inspiring film. And I can't wait to talk more about it with you uh, as the evening progresses. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lisa, for the introduction. I just feel so honored to be here today because we spent so much effort on this film. We spent two years on it and we finally finished it. And then we are sharing that with so many people and our amazing guests and our friends from everywhere. When we're getting the word out, we have friends from China, like showing so much support. And we know I've seen familiar names in our attendees. And I know we have friends from China and it's super early there. So thank you so much, everybody for, you know, uh, coming to our event. We're so honored. Well, Knox, thank you so much for bringing Lily's story uh, to the forefront so that um, so many more people can know about it. Um, Lily, I want to ask you the first question. Here's your opportunity to talk about Paul. Um, you know, when you lost the first election by 28 voice, uh, votes, Helen recalls you confiding, we lost the election, but the campaign strengthened our marriage. Now, campaigning was incredibly stressful, but Paul supported you wholly. So can I ask you more about Paul? First of all, where can we all find a Paul? <laughs> and um, look, gender roles were very different back then, but what did it mean for you to have such a supportive husband at that time? Yes, uh, as you know, I, Paul and I met when he was at UC Berkeley. He was an aerospace engineer for decades, but never felt he could rise above the glass ceiling. He took a one year leave of absence from his job to help with my campaign. I could not have achieved what I did without him. He registered hundreds of voters and kept a handwritten spreadsheet and recorded each and every one person he registered. He cooked, he cleaned, he did the dishes, and he was rock stable and strong. Like me, he had a strong conviction for Asian American representation. But his greatest motivation came from love and respect from being supportive of my lifelong goals, and wishes, and dreams. I truly, truly miss him. Knox, I think that might have to be your, your next film, the love story, the, the Paul and Lily love story. Right. I definitely <laughs> volunteer myself to, to, to take part in that because that is one that I would certainly love to hear. And it's just, it's so, um, incredible to hear uh, about your love story and, and how supportive and essential he was in your life. Thank you so much for sharing that, Lily. Um, Ambassador, Block, <laughs> Ambassador Block, you know, you've been the only woman and only Asian um, in, in the majority of your meetings and events throughout the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. So I wonder, how did you find your voice and what kinds of challenges did you have um, to overcome as an Asian American woman? Lisa says you have raised the question of a Chinese American voice. Let me first say that if there is one good thing that has come out of this terrible pandemic, it is the exposure of virulent anti-Asian hate in this country that has finally finally brought Asian Americans together to speak out, to fight the longstanding and historic exclusion, discrimination, and racism against Asians. So back to your specific question. It's very much an Asian story, how I created my voice. Hard work, always doing my homework, and always being prepared. Coming to America when I was nine, not speaking any English, my father drilled into me his mantra that as a Chinese American, I can only succeed in this country 
if I worked hard, studied hard, got good grades, got into the best schools and did better than my white American classmates. Somehow, I decided in sixth grade, less than a year after arriving in America, that I wanted to run for class president. I don't know why I decided that. My father was absolutely shocked when he saw me making my campaign post posters, promoting myself. This was not what a good Chinese girl did in those days. The gender stereotyping kicked in. Chinese girls are supposed to be modest and submissive, seen but not heard. I remember that in China, I was not allowed to eat with my parents until I was eight. And I was told not to speak at the table unless spoken to. But you know, my father did not stop me. And I went on to win. I ran for office again, not like Lily, but in high school for vice president of the student body. And I won again. Running for office and competing against white classmates taught me how to play the game in America, to speak up when Asians are generally taught to keep quiet. I learned how to navigate comfortably between two cultures, to mainstream. This would be very helpful when I started working. I noticed that in America, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Not like in Asia, where the nail that sticks out gets hammered. I learned to participate, to raise my hand, to ask questions, and to speak my mind. I honed my speaking skills and was prepared for meetings and volunteered for all kinds of assignments, but mindful always because I am Asian to be polite. As a result, I don't know how many times I've been told that I speak such wonderful English. Where did you come from? Or which country did you represent as ambassador? Even my friends told me I was not like other Chinese they knew, that I was too American. I leave you all with a question. Do you think that was an insult? or a compliment. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Block. Certainly uh, an important question to ponder, especially these days. Um, Russell, Dr. Jiang, you know, we saw what Asian hate looked like in the film with the English only legislation proposal. And today, incidents of violence directed at the AAPI community have just risen exponentially. What parallels do you see between what happened in the 80s and now? And, and also, you know, you co-founded Stop AAPI Hate, which is the first organization to record incidents of, of hate against the AAPI community. Um, where are we now? And is progress being made to stop the attacks? And are AAPIs becoming visible in the ways that they should be? Yeah, thanks for the question, Lisa. Um, to start, you know, what are the parallels when um, Mayor Chen was in office in the 1980s and today. Asians have historically and continue to be considered the yellow peril. That's the stereotype, one of the stereotypes we face as being perpetual foreigners who don't belong. We're outsiders who are supposed to be excluded. And so in Monterey Park, when Chinese began to come in larger numbers, and today, as we have more demographic change, I think a lot of communities, a lot of white communities feel threatened by the, the incoming changing demographics. So what's similar is, is actually um, the yellow peril fear. And today we have what's known as the great replacement theory. This is a notion that people of color are displacing whites, that it's a strategy, it's a calculated conspiracy for people of color to, to replace whites. And that fear of replacement is fueling an anti-CRT movement, a critical race theory, effort to, to get rid of um, all types of teaching in schools. And so we have to be really concerned that this long-standing stereotype has been invoked again. What's different now, though, is that, um, well, there are more Asians, 
there has been more change. And I think that fear has even grown more deeply. And because now we have social media today, people get fed conspiracy theories. People get are stuck into their own segregated um, social bubbles. So they hear the same type of political ideologies that foment racism, that encourage um, more political division. So what's happening now is that we have this renewed surge of anti-Asian racism. It was there in the 1980s, and then it gets re-invoked by political rhetoric today. Um, the President Trump's term Chinese virus really was deadly. It led to hate speech that led to hate violence. And so in the last years, our survey said one out of five Asian Americans have experienced racism. That's 4 million cases of hate. This is pervasive. This is violence. This is um, traumatizing for our communities. We just sadly had to grieve over the Laguna Wood shooting. Um, and then now we had to deal with the Ubalde sh shootings. And so we have increased violence. And the, what's given us hope during this dark time is that we have role models. You know, history's repeated itself with the yellow peril, but quickly, history's repeated itself that Asians have always fought back against racism. We fought against Chinese exclusion. We fought against Japanese American incarceration. Mayor Chen showed us a way how to fight back against the English only movement in the 1980s. And so today I'm really encouraged by the, the widespread global movement to stop AAPI hate. That's um, what's changed too. Now we have a, a larger movement, more in solidarity than ever before of Asian Americans speaking out against racism, people from all walks of life of all ages. So we are building on the legacy of Mayor Chen. We are building on the legacy of those who've gone before us in fighting this racism. And that's, um, that's what's heartening me at this moment. Yeah, Russell, I mean, it, it is inspiring how much the community has been galvanized and has come together and united in a way that I've never experienced in my life, lifetime. But it's so true that we have to continue fighting for diverse histories to be taught in schools. I mean, when I was growing up, if I had known um, about these incredible pioneers, right, if, if young people are able to get connected to stories about people like Mayor Chen or Ambassador Block, um, it will allow them to feel like they are part of this country. What happens when Asian American history is absent from our history books? It becomes so easy for people to overlook and even dehumanize uh, an entire community. And, and that has been what has been happening over the decades and particularly over the last few years. And so the only silver lining I see is that the AAP, uh, AAPI community has really woken up and we refuse to remain on the sidelines anymore. We refuse to, to stay on the periphery um, and have our voices silenced. And, and we have people like Mayor Chen and Ambassador Block to thank for exer exerting your voices and, and, and being unrelenting and running for class president in, in the sixth grade. <laughs> this is so, so inspiring. Um, Knox, I, I wanna talk to you. Where did you first learn about Mayor Chen's story and, and how did you go about putting it all together pre-vaccine when the main subject um, was, was, pre or was, was at risk, you know, as someone in her 80s, um, what were the challenges in making this and what was your objective ultimately in making this film? Right, those are great questions. So um, we're talking about, you know, share. we should share the story, share the role models. And that's how I got started. That's how I, you know, at the very beginning, how I got to know Lily. Because I, uh, back in 2020, early 2020, when COVID first started, I was in my second year at UCLA. And then I saw firsthand how my friends, how my classmates were judge or you know, just direct discrimination or prejudice because they're Asian, because they look Asian. Um, and then so I, like as a student, I felt the need to, you know, speak for my student community. And then I started running a campaign in the student government for the position of international student representative. At the time, I didn't know Lily yet, but, you know, I was running the campaign. And then it was very difficult because I grew up in China and I came to the United States only in 2018. So when, when it was 2020, I had only stayed two years here and I had no idea how to run a campaign. 
the US politics is all new to me. I had no idea. And because of you know the language barrier, the cultural barrier, I had nowhere. I I, I had no mentors on you know running a campaign. I don't even know to find a campaign manager. <laughs> So, you know, not surprisingly, I lost the campaign when the result came out in early May. So it was really, it taught me a hard lesson, you know, how difficult it is to, to speak for a community, to try to win, to fight for a position for our community when you don't have a mentor, you don't have a role model. And then just like a miracle, only a couple of weeks later after you know, the campaign result came out, I received an email from a friend who's actually here today, Edward. He introduced me from CLIA. Uh, he introduced me to Lily and saying, you know, uh, there's this amazing first Chinese American woman mayor and she wants to make a documentary. She's looking for a documentary producer. And it was mind blowing to me because I felt like, oh my God, someone else, you know, also didn't from, come from this country, come from China as an outsider, as a woman of color, run a campaign and almost 40 years ago in the 1980s. And it was an actual political campaign to be the mayor, to be on the city council, and she actually won. So it was mind blowing to me. And it, you know, just immediately, it's no brainer. I said, this is the project I wanna work on. This is the story I want to tell because it's, it inspired me so much. And I believe it will, it will inspire so many people. And that's why, you know, that's how we started this journey. And two years later, you know, we are here today. It's, yeah, it's, it's just amazing. It's been such a wonderful journey and we have this finished film here to share with everybody. And I really wish everybody, you know, take away to learn from Lily's story, to know that we have these amazing trailblazers and we have had these fights. And, you know, some things have changed over the years, some things haven't, and we still need to keep fighting. I think that's the purpose of me doing this project. Well, Knox, we're, we're, we're so glad you were able to make it because it is not only a beautiful film, but it's an urgent and important film. So thank you so much for, for, for your tenacity in, in seeing it through. Um, Mayor Chen, I, I have a question from, for you. Uh, you know, you, you have accomplished so much throughout your professional and, and, and personal life. I wonder if there is a, a, a particular accomplishment that you are proudest of? I think the, the, the most important message I want to give is that is my interest and in to come to help prepare for the next generation. And um, um, the, 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 lead, the leaders of uh, our community with the, the best blend of the East and the West Together, we can make things happen. Together, we can succeed. Well, thank you for that. Um, Ambassador Block and, and, and Dr. Jung, I, you know, over the past few years, the API community you know, has really been so, so battered on so many levels in the wake of COVID, but there have also been so many firsts and triumphs. How, how should we reconcile these things? Ambassador Block? That's a very good question because uh, through it all, with the surge in anti-Asian hate, I still believe in America. I believe that this country has been good to people like us here, even to Asian Americans, even though we've been discriminated against. So I've always asked myself this question, in what other country in this world would I, a first generation Chinese American, Asian American, be able to become ambassador? I think I can count on my, not even one, my one hand. So America, after all, is still a country, in my mind, a country of opportunity where it's not your class. It's not so much how much money you have. It's who you are as a person, that you have the ability to reach your potential. However, this country now, today, is not what it was. And we have, unfortunately, lost so much standing in the world. 
and look at the number of shootings in our schools. I believe 21 already in this year. How can that continue? We have got to get our country back, get it right again. And we need to end the polarization that has totally divided us and brought us to this state. And I hope that Russell Jung would have some ideas for us, particularly with respect to Asian Americans. What can we do? What can we contribute? Not just to ending racism against Asians, but ending racism for all people. Yes. Dr. Russell, Dr. I think you have great ideas. Well, I echo um, Ambassador Block's um, point that we as Asian Americans need to um, fight for racial justice, continue that struggle, not just for ourselves, but for, for everyone. Um, Lisa, you talked about, yeah, Asian Americans have made a lot of firsts recently. You know, we have films, we're, we're uh, Marvel heroes now, we're Olympic champions, we're represented in the media through you, Lisa. We have politicians and journalists, we have um, artists and so the range of Asian Americans entering mainstream society and contributing to it has really grown. And, and like um, Ambassador Block said, it's because we've worked hard, we've um, really been able to make contributions um, with our talents and with our efforts and with our cultural background. But then the responsibility then for us is to open the door even wider for others. We know that race is a barrier. We know that gender is a barrier. We know that class is a barrier, that even though America is a land of opportunity, even Mayor Chen faced so many barriers that others shouldn't have to face. So that, those of us who've entered into um, positions of power now have to use our positions to make um, America more open, to change who belongs, you know, change the narrative about who belongs to America. Right, because we're seen as foreigners, America treats foreigners really badly, so they feel like they could cough and spit on Asians because they see us as outsiders, not belonging. We have to change that perspective, first of all, that Asians do belong to America. And secondly, even if you are a foreigner, if you're an international student, you should still be treated with respect and dignity, right? And so we as Asian Americans have to change the narrative about who belongs to America, of, of, who belongs to America, and we have to change the culture to make it more Asian, where America respects its elders, where it protects its kids, where everybody is fed and treated as family. And so um, I think we as Asian Americans have to make America more Asian, and that's one of the ways we could actually um, contribute. That's so beautiful and profound, Russell. Um, Mayor Chen, uh, we, we're, we're uh, about to um, come to the end of the program, but you know when you when you hear about this this movement of AAPIs who are really standing up uh, in the face of violence and continuous scapegoating, and you see these voices who are advocating for equity and equality for all. Um, you are turning 86 years old, and you have been such a pioneer for our community and for all Americans. I just wonder if um, if I could get your thoughts and your perspective on on this this movement that has really arisen uh, in the last few years. You know, I do see hope, and I see lights, and I see so many younger generation of Asian Americans, of future leaders. They're self pride. They're too proud to be Asian Americans, and to be Chinese Americans. And uh, I see the togetherness that the, I see the opportunities pre being presented to, to all of us. And uh, uh, I see the, uh, the, 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 the essence, you know, we're, we're not, uh, we're not uh, just to be here concerned about our future and then we see the future ahead of us with new new opportunities and i i'm very optimistic 
Well, and I thank you, thank you. I cannot thank you enough for your presence. We're deeply honored. We're deeply honored. And uh, we need you. We need uh, an advocate like you. We need an advocate like Julie Block. We need an advocate like Russell. And now you have done a great job. And I'm proud of you. Well, it so helps all of us to have had you blazing that trail. I, I also want to, Lisa, I want to take this opportunity to thank my own daughter. And, and I think Helen has been working with Knox for more than two years. This is it. And Helen has made so many a personal sacrifice. She, she, you know, she had to wear so many hats. And she's she's the head of uh, City of Hope in South Pasadena, and she had to take care of her patients on a regular basis. And she is the mother of two of children, and she had to take care of her mother-in-law, and. Uh, Oh, you know, I cannot uh, under I cannot say enough about what Helen has done. She changed my life. I am just I don't see how I can survive without her. Well, Helen is incredible because she certainly has an amazing mom. And and Helen, um, there are some people that you would like to thank before we wrap. Right? Feel free to do so. Yeah. yeah. So I have been heavily involved in the, nothing creative about the film, but just in uh, supporting Knox and my mother. So, um, um, so I really want to thank Knox. She's the hardest person I've ever met. I just know she's been very hard working throughout and, and through the pandemic, she worked hard to keep my mother safe. And we worked together on that. So I really appreciate her. Um, my mom got COVID after <laughs> the film was done, um, but she survived. Um, I, and I want to thank Julia, who's been my mother's friend for decades, the 70s. So they go way back, just dearest friends. And Russell, who's done so much for everyone, he was my freshman dorm mate before he became famous. So we <laughs> lived in Okada House at Stanford. So it's really cool to see Russell again. Um, but I, um, and uh, Louis and uh, Lou, uh, shout out to Montage, uh, this film platform that's fairly young. I hope people uh, watch it, films. Um, but really, Lisa, I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I want everyone to know Lisa, it's her 15th <laughs> wedding anniversary today. Yeah, and she's about to go to dinner. And she's taking her time on this special day just to be with us while her daughter is getting over COVID. And um, I know Lisa through her husband, Paul, who's a, a brilliant radiation oncologist who's um, doing other things now. Um, but I wanna recognize how my father was a Paul who was just incredible. I wish he could be with us here today. And Lisa has a Paul who's just as incredible <laughs> because I know he's a doctor, but he's also an activist. And he is at home, took his time off this week to care of his daughter. So none of us um, could do all these things without the people, be, you know, behind us, our husbands, our spouses, and I could not have take care of my mom or doing any of this without my own husband, Bill. And I know he's watching today. He lets me pursue things, takes care of our dog. Uh, he uh, gets kids dinner. He did all that <laughs> growing up. So I had the role model of my father. Um, yeah, that's, um, yeah. And I most of all want to help my mother. I mean, thank my mother. Um, she's a dreamer, so she kind of instilled dreams in me. It's like, oh, why don't you fly to Stanford? I never would have done that unless she suggested it. Um, you know, she just instills dreams and thinks they can happen. I don't know where she gets that from. <laughs> um, well, but, well, this has been, and this it's her birthday tomorrow, so I know. Happiest, happiest birthday, Lily Chen. Well, listen, this has been an absolute honor and and pleasure for me to to be in your virtual presence, Knox. Really quickly, tell everyone where they can see the film. Right. So the film will be on Montage website where you sign up for the event. You should be able to see the full film. 
uh, and feel free to you know check it out after the event because we know through Zoom the quality is compromised a little. But feel free to go on Montage website and then the film will be there. And then feel free to follow all of us on social media. Uh, we will uh, post all the updates about the project. Oh, and also a little bit I want to add on. So we are planning to do uh, screenings in uh, across different colleges and schools, high schools. So if you you know if you have interest, if you have contacts, feel free to contact us. And I will send uh, my email and Louise Montage email in the chat section. So feel free to reach out to us through the emails on social media. Yeah, thank you so much Olga, for coming out today. The film is called Rocking the Boat, the story of Lily Lee Shen. Everyone, thank you so much for sharing this hour with all of us. It has been such a pleasure. Mayor Chen, uh, Ambassador Block, Dr. Russell Jung and Knox, thank you so much. Uh, I wish you all a, a beautiful evening and please watch this film and share it with your friends because we all need some inspiration these days. Thank you all. Thank you.